You are listening to the Jewel City Podcast. To help us spread the gospel of Jesus, give us a five-star rating. That'll help others find this podcast. In this podcast, we'll hear a message from Pastor Robert. Today is a uh, special day in my mind and in several of our minds. Uh, Today, 28 years ago, uh, we opened Jewel City Church in, uh, in a garage the old action Chevrolet garage. We couldn't afford to pay the rent and I talked the owner in, uh, I can sell snow to an Eskimo. (laughs) I talked the owner into uh, giving us rent free for 90 days if we cleaned the garage up. It was a bankrupt action Chevrolet garage. It's the dollar store now. And he uh, allowed us to have the showroom, the parts room, a bathroom and a little office. And I remember January 8th of 94 standing at the door wondering if anybody would come. And we had about 23 people. And God has definitely been faithful. And what Pastor Kerry said, uh, this property, which we had built a new facility a couple years after we opened out on Route 20 and outgrew it. But this property literally was the city of Shinston's uh, garbage dump. Uh, not actually where this building is setting, but actually where my house is built. And uh, God can take your garbage and turn it into something beautiful. Uh, so I walked in here last night like I normally do on uh, Saturday And I just stood here and I looked around and I thank God uh, for the facility, but the facility is not the purpose of God. It's the vehicle that allows us to reach people and change their lives. So if you would stand with me this morning, Uh, let me tell you one quick story, all right? Um, Stand with me. Come on, come on, come on. Man, we're slow today. My wife and I, we love to take drives together. We just like to be together. And uh, we drove yesterday to Doddridge County. Uh, We ended up on a side road that went across the creek. We went across the creek, Uh, got a four wheel drive truck. And then the road turned into the creek bed. And I looked at my wife and I said, hmm, we've been here before on the side by side with the spikers. So we kept going and kept going and kept going. And finally I got to a place where I thought I could get turned around and we came back. So instead of turning left on the highway, which we came, we went to the right. Now I'm in Doddridge County and this is a three hour drive. We ended up in Weston. And I don't have a clue how I got to Weston. I looked at my wife, I said, I was always fearful. People told me all my life I was gonna end up in Weston. (laughs) Some of you know what I'm talking about. Some of you ain't got a clue. Mental hospital in Weston, all right? So, but on that journey somewhere along the road, we come by an old farmhouse and it was a utility trailer, a real long utility trailer. And it had old church pews that were painted, stacked on that and had a blue tarp across the top. And knowing that today was our 28th birthday, my mind went back to Harry Sharp, our first church member. He's with the Lord now. He took me in a dump truck to Reesville to a church built in the late 1800s that had been closed for many, many years. And they gave us their church pews. And time we loaded them and hauled them back to the church where we was going to start. The legs had fallen off of some of them. They were in pretty bad shape and we rebuilt those. And they had a leg on each end and they had a leg in the middle. And that leg in the middle was longer (laughs) than the legs on the end. Just let me reminisce. This might not mean anything to anybody, but it's where God has been faithful all of our life. Harry showed up with used lumber. Whoa, I about fell right there. That would have gave you a laugh. Harry showed up with used lumber and he had a Maxwell coffee can, true story, full of bent nails. And him and I sat on the floor and we straightened those nails and we built the first stage. It was about the size of that drum room. (laughs) And I still remember Harry holding that nail and he hit it 
thumb real hard and he cussed. And he was there on his knees and I looked, I just laid back. I was on my knees too. We was working. I just laid back on the floor and laughed. And I said, well, Harry, at least you're on your knees. You can ask God to forgive you. But there have been a lot of people sow and invest into where we're at today. The title of the message, God really cares about you. Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, God really cares about you. I want to read Isaiah chapter 40, verse 1. I'm glad I'm only reading verse 1. You look tired this morning. You couldn't stand much longer. <laughs> comfort ye, comfort ye my people, saith your God. Pastor Aaron, bless the reading of the word of God. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, you are a mighty God. And Father, I pray that you would comfort your people today. I pray, Lord, that your word would comfort our hearts, Lord God. But Father, I pray for a transformation of our hearts also. Lord, I pray that we would be changed, Lord God. Father, I pray that what we receive today, Lord God, that we would take into ourselves, Lord God. As it said, share the testimony, Lord God. Father, that we would testify of our Savior, Lord God. That we would testify that we stand on holy ground, Lord God. And everywhere that we plant our foot is holy ground, Lord God. Father, I pray that you would anoint the pastor, Lord God. Pastor Robert, every word that he studied, Lord God. Everything that he brings forth today, Lord God. May it just touch us, Lord God. It changes, Lord God, from the inside out, Lord God. Father, I'm thankful for the saints that have come before. But Lord, I'm looking forward to the saints that you're going to grow That's and continue right. to move forward. Amen. Lord God, Jewel City Church is for the community and for you, Lord God. And we just ask your blessing up on the people in the name of Jesus. And amen. Amen. You may be seated. I've preached for a long time, never sat on a chair, but lately I've been doing a lot of that. Isaiah 40 and 1, let's uh, read that again. Comfort ye, comfort ye my people, saith your God. This is actually meant to be John's message that he would proclaim later in the New Testament. So I wanna compare Isaiah chapter 40, verse three, with John 1 and 23. Isaiah chapter 40 and three, the voice of him that crieth in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Isaiah wrote this about 681 years before Christ. When he says preparing a straight, smooth, it means removing obstacles and rolling out the red carpet for the coming of the Lord. The wilderness is a place of life's trials and sufferings. And if we were to be honest, we've all experienced some wilderness in our life. And this morning, I'm sure there's many that feel like you are in the wilderness today. But God really cares about you. Can someone say amen? These troubles and these trials, we are not immune to these, but our faith need not be hindered by them. Don't fall apart when these situations show up in your life Reach down and grab a hold of the word of God, the foundation that God has built you upon and stand strong because all your life, God has been faithful. Somebody give God a hand clap and a shout of praise. So let's compare to John chapter one, verse 23. He said, I am the voice of the one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord as said the prophet Isaiah. People who do not know Jesus need to be prepared to meet him. Both prophets, prophet of old in Isaiah and, and John, both prophets taught the message of repentance. Somebody say repentance. Repentance is good news to those who will listen and seek forgiveness. Not only repentance when we come before the Lord in salvation, but throughout our life, we need to have repentance. Somebody say amen. So Isaiah chapter 40, verse two. Speak you comfortably to Jerusalem and cry unto her that her warfare is accomplished, that her iniquity is pardoned, for she hath received of the Lord's hand double for all of her sins. Even though the nation of Israel suffered and was led into captivity, 
No amount of physical suffering, none. Not even losing their nation, not even going into captivity, all of the terrible things that happened to them could not pay for the sins in their life. Nothing. You cannot pay for your spiritual transgressions and sins in the natural. Cannot be done. So oftentimes people, they say things. People who wonder, how can a loving God ever send somebody to hell? If you say that, you do not have a true revelation of sin. Sin is such a terrible transgression against God that eternity, even in a place of torment, could not pay for your sins. Why? Because God is holy. And I've been thinking about this. We come to church, but we need to be the church. Amen. We just come in and we just feel like, you know, well, we're going to sing a few songs, but we need to leave being the church. We need to leave with a mentality of every choice, every decision that I do is going to be holy unto God. It's going to be what God would have for me and my family. Somebody say amen. See, God is holy. Somebody say God is holy. For Samuel 2 and 2, there is none holy as the Lord. For there is none beside thee, neither is there any rock like our God. He's holy. He's a rock. He's unchangeable. When all else fails, he will not fail you. I believe that. When all else falls apart, God is still faithful in your life. Has God been faithful to anybody at Jewel City, even in the midst of adversity? Give him a hand clap. First Peter 1 and 15, but as he which have called you is holy, so be ye holy in all, somebody say all, in all manner of conversation, because it is written, be ye holy, for I am holy. Every decision says for all, there is consequences with our choices. The choice you make today, the choice you make tomorrow, will not only affect you, it will affect everybody that is around you. And there is only one way to make a choice, and that's by the leading of the Holy Spirit. And God will lead you because God cares about you. You have not been left alone. You have not, God has not turned his back on you. God cares about you, but God wants us to grow up a little bit and become holy like him and follow his way, follow his word, follow his will for our lives, even when it's something we don't feel like we want to do. When I go by my feelings, I get myself in trouble. But when I go by God's word and God's leading, God will take me from the garbage dump to the promised land. Has God delivered anybody from the garbage dump and brought you to the promised land because you was obedient? My, my, my. Listen to me, many live a super holy life by the standards of man. And I was thinking about how can I illustrate this, you know. Many people live a, a holy life by the standards of man. And, and I was thinking, and, and my wife probably cringes every time I mention her name, because they don't know where I'm headed half the time. But if you was to look at my wife's life, by man's standards, She's never touched alcohol or a cigarette. She, she never done drugs. She saved herself. I could go on and on and on. That's her story. Now here's my story. Oh <laughs> Bruce, you never let me down. If you didn't hear him over, he said, oh boy. Here's my story. Messed up from the floor up. Don't look at me. Every, I can just feel everybody looking at me with your long religious nose. Messed up 
a heathen, an absolute heathen. But in the eyes of God, there was no difference because we are all sinners in need of a savior. Not a church experience, but a blood-bought relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ that says, I want to change by the power and the anointing of God that will take me out of the garbage dump and put my life into the promised land that I can be a blessing to a holy God and be a blessing to everyone around me. Somebody, anybody, give him a hand clap and a shout of praise. Why? Why would somebody, why, excuse me, why would a loving God send somebody to hell? I've had it many times said that once you and I see, really see the glory of God, we will realize our unworthiness. Listen, when Isaiah saw the Lord, when Isaiah saw the Lord in all of his splendor, in all of his glory, he fell on his face and listened to what he cried out. Isaiah six and five, then said I, woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I will dwell in the midst of people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Why don't you and I, why don't I just speak to myself? I need to take a look at myself. We need to look at the splendor and the glory of our God. And then look at ourselves and ask ourselves, what gives us the right to be mad at God? What gives us the right to say, why would a loving God send somebody to hell? Why would God not answer my prayer? Why would God not restore me? Why would God let my loved one pass away? Listening to the praise of the angels. Isaiah realized he was common and unclean before God. With no hope of measuring up to God's standard of holiness. And our only hope to be, to be measured up to God's standard of holiness is Jesus Christ and his righteousness. Can someone say amen? Because I, my righteousness is nothing but filthy rags. But there was a blood shed on a cross that has covered me and cleansed me. And he is worthy of my praise. He is worthy of your praise. We have no hope outside of Jesus. If you got hope in Jesus, put your hands together and bless the Lord. Anyone who says, I can't believe that a loving God would send somebody to hell has never seen imperfect man in the light of God's perfection. God is absolutely perfect. And there is nothing perfect about you and I. They've not seen the transgressions and total mess that man is made of things. It seems like every generation we go further and further down the road. So even the so-called good people have seriously transgressed against the Lord. Romans 3 and 23 said, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, all. Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, he's talking about you. Listen to me, there is no way, there is just no way that you can pay for the transgressions of your sins that you have made, no way. Listen to Isaiah 40 and two, speak you comfortably to Jerusalem and cry unto her that her warfare is accomplished, that her iniquity is pardoned, for she received of the Lord's hand double for all of her sins. Their captivity, their warfare, their hardship is over. It was a prediction of God's deliverance from the Babylonian captivity. Their sins are paid for, their sins are pardoned because they had obviously repented. And I believe I'm in a room today that your warfare is over. The battle is over. Because of repentance, 
My sins and your sins have been forgiven. Do you hear me? You and I will never have the standards of the holiness of God, but through repentance we are saved. Salvation is ours and the Lord God cares about you. Give him a hand clap and a shout of praise. My prayer would be whatever's in my life and whatever's in your life today that we would fall before a holy God and we would repent of our sins and then God will be faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us up and take the garbage out of our life and place us in to the promised land of God. He is a good, good God, but there is only one way to heaven. There's only one way to live on this earth and that is through the word and the way and the will of God. No other way will bring you peace in your life. No other way will bring satisfaction in your life unless you have a relationship with Jesus Christ. All my life, he has been faithful. He is a faithful God and he wants to do it in your life. He wants to do it in your marriage. He wants to do it in your finances. He wants to do it in your church. He wants to do it at your job. He is faithful. God cares about you, but we've got to live holy before a holy God. Somebody give him a hand clap and a shout of praise. My, my, my. Man, oh man, oh man. There is nothing, nothing better than when you fall before the Lord and say, Lord, here I am. Forgive me, Lord. Isaiah 40 and 2 is a prophetic scripture speaking about the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not talking about how in the natural Jerusalem had suffered enough that their sins were paid for. That said, the war is over. This verse is referring to the war God had toward mankind for their sins. It was a war because of our sins. And it's saying when the Messiah comes, he's going to bear your sins. It's a prophetic scripture. The warfare will be over because your sins will have been paid for. Sometimes we feel like we're still in a war. You know, we're still in his flesh, but the victory is already ours. The victory is already ours because of Jesus giving his life on a cross. Do you hear me this morning? Jesus bore our sins and now the warfare is over. If you continue down through the rest of Isaiah 40, you'll see that the whole chapter is prophetically speaking of Jesus and what he would accomplish when he arrived. It's saying that John the Baptist was to proclaim to the people that the wrath of God had now been satisfied. The wrath of God. He is a God of wrath. Do you hear me? John was saying that the war is over. And I want to say something to everybody in this room, and I want you to grab a hold of this. God is not angry with you. God is not angry with you. There's doctrines out there that teach if you mess up, if you do wrong, I am not making light of sin. But listen, God is not mad at you. God knew before the beginning of time that you could not live up to his standards. God is not mad at you. God does not like sin. Sin is not the issue. Oh, I'm gonna get an email tomorrow. Sin is not the issue. The issue is unforgiveness. The issue is a lack of repentance. Why do we water down the blood of Jesus? And we say, well, you gotta come to my church. You gotta dress this way. You gotta do that. You gotta do this. No, 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 no. You got to come to the blood of Jesus Christ. You got to confess that you are a sinner, that he is a savior. You've got to ask him into your life. And let him, quit trying to clean everybody up and let him clean them up. Amen? Again, listen, don't take me wrong. I'm not making light of sin. I'm not telling you, I'm not preaching a greasy grace. Sloppy, grace, whatever. I'm preaching that God is not angry with you and you will fall, you will fail. Jesus had paid for our sins. He was marred more than any man. Isaiah 52 and 13. Behold, my servant shall deal prudently. He shall be exalted and extolled and be very high. As many were astonished at the, his visage was so marred more than any man and his form more than the sons of men. But through his suffering, he would cleanse nations. He would cleanse you and I. 
Jesus' face marred more than any person who has ever lived. Listen to Isaiah 42 and 14 again. His visage, his face was so marred more than any man and his form more than the sons of men. In the original Hebrew language, it means that Jesus didn't even look human. Do you remember when the Passion of Christ, Mel Gibson, wrote the story? And I remember during an interview, he said that a lot of people said it was too, it just looked too violent, too, shouldn't do that. Said he even had to scale back because it was so much more. He became sin, how? He became sin. Jesus took our sins into his own body on the cross. Listen to 1 Peter 2 and 24. Who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree. Isaiah 53 and 5. But he was wounded for our transgression. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. The truth, he died for us. He died for our griefs. He died for our sorrows, our transgressions, and our iniquities. The purpose of his death to give us peace. Do you have peace today? Peace, wonderful peace. Do you have peace? I can stand and tell you I've got peace of God and I've got peace with God. And how do I keep that? It comes through repentance because I fall short of the glory of God also. Do you hear me? Do you have peace today in your life, in your family? Every sin, I want you to think about every sin, every sickness, every tumor, every deformity, every adultery, every sexual immorality, on and on and on, entered into the physical body of Jesus Christ. Entered in, his face and his body so distorted that he didn't even look like a human. Matthew 26 and 36, let me repeat the title, God cares for you. Then cometh Jesus with them unto a place called Gethsemane and saith unto the disciples, sit ye here while I go and pray yonder. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee and began to be sorrowful. This is our Lord and very heavy. And then saith he unto them, my soul is exceeding sorrowful, even unto death. Tarry ye here and wait with me. And he went a little further. And this morning early I underlined that, he went a little further. He didn't quit. A lot of us quit too soon. He went a little further and he fell on his face and he prayed. What did he do? He prayed. When he had the heaviness, he didn't turn around, he went a little further. How far will you go for God to meet you? How far will you go for God to rescue you, for to deliver you, to restore? How far will you go? And will you go with the world and the crowd that so easily will pull you? Or will you humble yourself and bow? and pray to the Lord. He fell on his face and he prayed saying, oh Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as I will. Nevertheless, Father, not what I want, but Father, what you want. And I think right there is a lesson for all of us. If we could just get self out of our way, and say, not what I want, Father. This decision that I'm about to make, this road that I'm about to take, whatever it may be in your life, Father, it's not what I want. Father, what do you want? Verse 42, he went away again the second time. And he prayed saying, oh, Father, if this cup may not pass away from me, except I drink it, thy will be done. Jesus was in great anguish over his coming physical pain, but he was in greater anguish because of his separation from the Father. And sin separates us from our Father. Stand with me this morning. 
His strength to obey, listen to this, under this great amount of pressure, his strength to obey came from his relationship with his father. His strength in the midst of his suffering came from his relationship with his father. So where do you get your strength in the midst of your suffering? Comes from your relationship with the Father. I see people, Pastor Rita, in difficult times, it either make them better or bitter. You have got to go a little further. And you've got to humble yourself and pray and say, God, I'm in the fiery furnace. I'm in pressure. And God, I don't want to do my will. God, I want to do thy will. And when you come to that place in your life, and that is a hard place to be, a hard place to arrive. I, I deal with it all the time. I got to die to my wants. When you come to that place, God will turn things around in your life and bless you like you've never been blessed before. I was with a guy Friday. I was a part of a, a blessing. And this gentleman said something to me and my wife and I discussed it again yesterday. He said, I was really never obedient until I started attending Jewel City Church. He was talking about certain areas of his life. And he said, now God has been so faithful and God is blessed. And these are the words he said. I wonder how many blessings I missed because I wasn't obedient. In other words, wonder how many blessings I've missed because I did what I wanted to do instead of what God wanted me to do. Forsaken by his father. People say, how could a loving God send somebody to hell? Jesus forsaken by his father on the cross. Mark 15 and 34, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? The physical anguish was horrible, but the greatest pain that he suffered was being forsaken, was the separation from his God. Scripture reveals that hell will include such physical pain. Listen, Luke 16 and 24, and he cried and he said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue for I am tormented in this flame. There's not a lot of preaching about hell anymore, but there is a hell. There will be not only physical pain, there will be emotional pain, but there'll also be the pain of being separated from God, which will be more pain than anything that I've just mentioned. Amen. More pain is being separated from God. Everything in hell, everything good and everything God will not be there. Think about it. Take every good thing that we enjoy in America and every good thing around the world, every good person and every godly thing will not be there. The title, God cares for you. Jesus bore that. He bore that. God forsook his son that you and I would not be forsaken. How can a loving God send somebody to hell? We go to hell, we go there because of our own choices. Because he forsook his own son. My son, Cody's standing right there. And Robbie's probably here somewhere. If I heard him scream, I'd come to the rescue and don't get in my way. But God cares about us that he turned his back because Jesus 
was a sacrifice that rescued you and I. Will a loving God send somebody to hell? He gave his son for you, for me. Every head bowed and every eye closed. Not only did he give his son for our salvation, he gave that we could have peace and joy, health, wealth. He gave it all. Jesus gave it all. He paid the price. He paid for it all. Have you been coming just to come to church? Or have you been coming so you could leave to be the church? God wants to change everything in our lives because he cares about us. If you're here this morning and you're saved, do you know the Lord? What you feel like today, this message spoke to your heart. You need God to do a refreshing, to do a new work in your life in your family, in your relationships, whatever it may be, would you slip your hand up high? Slip your hand up high. Is there one? Many, my goodness, all over. Would you step out of your seat this morning and walk to an altar? You're not in a church where people are gonna say, oh my goodness, well there's Joe. I wonder what's going on in Joe's life. No, you're in a church where people will root and cheer you on and will pray for you. Would you come and pray? If you raised your hand, come and pray. Make a step of faith. Do you need a miracle? Do you need a miracle? Do you need God to move in your life? There's something about coming to an altar. Would you come? I want to give a salvation invitation in a minute, but I want to wait. Pastor Kerry, can you just sing a little bit of something, please? Would you come? People coming. That's right. Keep coming. Keep coming. Are you in a battle? Are you in a war? We are not alone. I was thinking about this this morning. The Bible said we have not because we ask not. Would you come and ask him this morning? Would you come and ask him to move in your life? praying every head bow every eye closed nobody I'm, I'm not going to come to you you're here this morning and you've not given your life to Christ the Bible says today is the day of salvation God really loves you he cares about you would you give your heart would you give your life to him if you're here this morning and you don't know him but you'd like to you've never prayed and asked Christ to forgive you of your sins slip your hand up real high Real quick, just slip your hand up. Just slip your hand up. Is there one? Is there one? Anybody this morning? Anybody this morning? Anybody? Thank you for listening to the Jewel City Podcast. 